The first lesson of the scripture reading today comes from Kings 21, 20 through 25. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon you. I will utterly sweep you away and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. For the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dogs shall eat Jezebel within the bounds of Jezreel. And, any, and anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the air shall eat. Our gospel passage comes to us from the gospel according to Luke. There in the seventh chapter, beginning at the 36th verse. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman of the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, and she began to bathe his feet with her tears, and she dried them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing him with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is not touching him and, she, and that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, who owed, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? So end our lessons for this day. In the Wednesday evening Bible study, we're reading together the book of, Par of the Proverbs. And Proverbs in other places are called the book of poetry, the book of wisdom, the book of knowledge. Throughout the last many years, I've been using classic poetry as our prayers because it is such good material. But even more, because poetry requires that we do something different. In our ordinary life, we communicate in so many different ways. We text, we send emojis, we often speak in prose, we sometimes speak in profanity. In worship, we need to speak differently. We need to speak in a different kind of language, like poetry. Poetry has a different rhythm about it, a different meter and cadence. Poetry has incredible phrases that make you stop and wonder about the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees. Poetry makes you pay attention to the word. Poetry slows us down and regulates our breathing. But more than all the rest, when you've come into this place on Sunday morning, you've gotten your family up, you've put on your suit and tie, and gotten your kids to sit still for an hour, you know what's going to come. And so we have to come at you a slant. We need to come at the issues of life and death and trust and forgiveness, not talking plainly and comfortably about it, because we'd think it was trite. we dismiss the words too easily. Instead, poetry allows us, proverbs and parables, allow us to come at these issues from the slant, to wonder and to question. It's said that Jesus said everything in parables. He never said anything to the crowds that was not in parables. That made me begin to wonder that perhaps not only the parables Jesus said, but Jesus' whole life is not only true, but also is a parable for us. And if Jesus' life is, then the whole of each gospel is. And if the whole of the gospel is, then maybe the whole of the Bible is. And maybe our lives are parables as well. This story is recorded in each of the gospels. 
But in the other Gospels, it's told differently. In the other Gospels, it's told as Lazarus and Martha's sister on the night before the Last Supper anointed Jesus' feet as an anointing for burial for the dead. Here, it happens early in the Gospel of Luke, just after Jesus has raised a son who was dead, just after Jesus has healed a servant of a centurion, just after John the Baptist's disciples have come asking Jesus whether he truly is the Messiah or not, comes this story. And after this, Jesus continually tells parables until the time he sets his face to go to Jerusalem. This story serves as a transition point for us. Something's happening here that we need to pay attention to. And in it is a parable inside of a parable inside of a parable. Jesus comes to dinner. That much we're sure about. Those who are at the table are a Pharisee and Jesus. And a woman of the street comes in. By being a woman in that culture, she was considered a sinner. By being a woman of the street, she's probably a prostitute. In parables, we stop to recognize each individual person and what they say because they're said here for a meaning. They're not simply included as extras, but instead everything that's included has a purpose and a point. A few weeks ago, I told a parable about someone who was driving and speeding their car, and they got caught and brought before the police, and the police turned them before the judge, and the judge described the fine that was offered of $100 or five days in jail, and the person couldn't pay the fine for it either. And so the judge took off their robes and set them aside and stepped out from behind the bench and stood next to the person in a suit and tie and paid the $100 for them, and then came back up to the bench and resumed their role as judge. Whenever in the Bible there is the true judge who pays an exorbitant amount for us, we know that that is God. This is like confirmation class. Whenever there is a question that you're not sure the answer, it's either God or Jesus. Okay? In this story, Jesus is seated at the table of a Pharisee. And the Pharisees believed themselves to be righteous. They followed the law strictly so that they knew best how everyone else should live. And they made themselves into judges. The problem when we try to make ourselves into judges is we try to make ourselves into God. And when we do, we assume there is no real God. There's only what I want. At table... Jesus turns to the Pharisee and addresses him by name because those who are righteous always like to know that people know that they're righteous and know their name. And he calls him Simon. And asks Simon, there were once two creditors who owned an enormous amount. One owed 202 years of wages. The other owed almost two months of wages. Which one? When they were forgiven, do you think loved him more? To Jesus, I think he loved both. God loves each of us and forgives us all our debts. But the Pharisee wanted to judge. And so he describes that the one who's forgiven more must surely love more. And Jesus says, that's right. So, hospitality is the most basic thing to all of us. When a stranger comes to our door and they're in need, we welcome them in. We take care of those who are in need. When a stranger came to, Fer to Simon the Pharisee's house, he was to offer some very basic customs. How many of us during the summer months when it's warm outside and the kids have been playing down at the beach put a basin of soapy water out by the deck? I'm the only one who does that? <laughs> We always did at our house as the children came in to get all the grass off and all the dirt off before he came into the house. So it was also in the Middle East at that time when you came in, you were supposed to wash your feet. Yet Simon left nothing for Jesus to wash his feet. When you greet a stranger, the Roman way was not just to offer a handshake, but to offer a handshake to disarm the person and make sure they didn't have a sword up their sleeve that was going to stab you. 
But in Judaism, it was different. When you greet a stranger, you don't check for weapons, you kiss them. A Christian kiss was a way of greeting each other and welcoming one another as being intimate, trusted, baptized, claimed, and loved. And even more, before you sit down to eat, you need to wash your face and hands. In that culture, you anoint it. Remember, this is a parable. Everything that's there has a meaning. So they're seated for what? A meal at a table. You remember in the Old Testament, there's a psalm that we all know very well. It comes in the 23rd Psalm about there is a table laden with all kinds of good food for us, and our head is anointed with oil, and our cup runneth over. Whenever you hear that there is a table, that's what you think of. So Jesus was at the table, and Jesus was anointed, but not by Simon. Instead of having his head anointed with oil, instead of having a basin to wash his feet, instead of being greeted with a kiss, this stranger, this woman of the streets, this prostitute, this sinner, she's the one who washed his feet with her tears. She's the one who kissed him, not on the cheek, not on the forehead, but on his feet. She's the one who wiped his feet and anointed him with the oils from her hair. This is personal. This is intimate. This is very real. Just as our lives, very personal and very real and very intimate. Now that you've got how this game plays with the Every person having a meaning, every thing in the story having a meaning, every story having a meaning, and what is said. We have the passage that Tim read for us from the book of Kings. Now, you know going into this, when there's a story about kings in Israel, there's going to be a problem. Because who is the one true king? And, and when, in, this is the Old Testament. And when we, hang in there, Steve, we'll get you. And when there is a king in Israel, the prophet had described before the anointing of the first king that what kings are going to do, they're going to take your sons for war. They're going to take your daughters for their harems for themselves. They're going to take your land and your possessions for themselves. And King Ahab is the worst among the whole lot. King Ahab took them into many different wars and worship of many different idols instead of worship of the true king. And even more than all of that, King Ahab took a wife who was a Jezebel. When I was about 12, we went on a mission trip to Cow Creek, Kentucky. And at Cow Creek, Kentucky, there was a little tiny Presbyterian church that only had 20 members, and one of them was a 100-year-old woman who was the Bible study teacher. And she'd been teaching Bible study ever since she was 12 years old. And she started off talking to us about a Jezebel. And you know what a Jezebel is. And I didn't know what a Jezebel was. And she described, a Jezebel is one who wants all your money, wants all your power. She wants to get everything she can get for herself, and she's not afraid to use anything she's got to get it. And Jezebel was the queen. She was such a Jezebel, her name was Jezebel. And so it is that the king has all power and has a wife who's trying to amass all power and all wealth. However, right next door to the palace is a lovely little vineyard, a vineyard that creates the best wine in all the kingdom. It is the best, most fertile land in all the kingdom. It's owned by Naboth, the Jezreelite, and they're in the area, the county of Jezreel. So you know something going into this. Naboth is of that territory. This is his homeland. This is his sacred inheritance. This is where his family all come from. And Ahab decides that he likes that little plot of land outside his window that he wants to make into a garden. Now remember, everything has a meaning. Tables represent 
Psalm 23 in the table. Anointing represents the anointing we're going to have. If I say garden, you think of the Garden of Eden. If we talk about a vineyard, which is what he had there, there is a great parable in Isaiah that describes that all the world, especially the nation of Israel, is like the Garden of Eden that God has created. This great gardener has formed and built a wall around to protect it. But the plants overgrew the garden, and the plants knocked down the walls, and when they did, all kinds of creatures came in and corrupted the garden until it could be redeemed and healed and become a garden afresh and anew. All that you have to have in your mind when you hear that Ahab wanted to have Naboth's vineyard as his own garden. So he went to Naboth and said, tell you what, give me your piece of property and I'll give you whatever it's worth. I'll pay you for it. Or I'll give you an even better garden. However, we just said this was the best piece of property in all the kingdom. It produced the very finest wines. So how could there be a better piece? And Naboth says, but it's not about money. And it's not about the value of the land. This is not my farm. This is not my home. This is my ancestral property. When Moses led the people to the promised land and we were brought in, we each received a family plot. And this is my family's plot. For the last thousands of years, this has been my family's homeland. I can't give away God's inheritance. I can't sell it. I can't trade it. This belongs to God and I'm simply the keeper of it. And Ahab says, I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I can't get what I want. And he goes into his house and crawls into his bed and pulls the covers up over his head. He's depressed. He's frustrated. And Queen Jezebel says to the king, aren't you the king of all Israel? You've got all power. All you need to do is claim it by eminent domain. If not that, then set up two people who are scoundrels and pay them to accuse Naboth and have him arrested and put to death. You're the king. And that's what he does. He has a great feast in which Naboth is going to be the guest of honor. And at this great feast, two scoundrels are paid to accuse Naboth of blasphemy and of treason. And they do, and he's arrested, and he's taken out, and he's put to death. And Ahab gets the vineyard as his garden. And he's walking through the garden. Jack, have you ever heard of a man walking through a garden before? It happens in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve were walking in the garden after they had tasted of the fruit that they weren't supposed to taste. And God sought them out. In this case, it's a man of God. It's the prophet, Elijah. When we think of Jesus, okay, Steve, when we think of Jesus, we usually think of him like in the anthem we just sang, knocking at the door. Every painting I've ever seen of that shows Jesus smiling. I really think they've painted it wrong that in the world today, instead of Jesus knocking at the door to try to get in, we need to be thinking about trying to get out into the world and spread the word. Every time we think of Jesus, we think of this one who holds babies in his lap, this one who welcomes children, this happy, smiling creature. What must be in Ahab's heart that he greets the man of God saying, so you found me, oh my enemy. He's not a happy camper. He's not one who's been like the Pharisee who's trying to do right. He's one who has fought against God, who's trying to get everything for himself. And so Ahab describes, what's going to happen to you is that you're going to die. You're going to die a miserable, awful death. And the dogs are going to come and eat your flesh and lick up your blood. Ahab repents. Ahab puts on sackcloth. Ahab says, it's okay. Come here, Penelope. Come here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Elijah says to Ahab that he's done wrong. 
And Ahab realizes it. And he puts on a sackcloth bib and he prays. And God forgives even Ahab. And he has three years of a wonderful life. And then Ahab sinned again, for which he died in battle and the dogs came and ate his flesh and licked up his blood. But he was forgiven. Even Ahab, who had done such terrible wrongs, who had claimed to be king as if there was no God, Ahab was forgiven. So for all of us, there is hope. Fifteen years ago, this congregation sent me for doctoral study. It was one of the best educations I've ever had because it was an education about this church and about my own faith and struggles. One of the best things that happened there was a class with Walter Brueggemann, the Old Testament professor. And he gave to each of us an assignment. Pick your favorite three Bible passages. Your favorite three. Pick three that you've never read before, that you've never encountered. Now, tell the story of your church, tell the story of your life with those six stories. It doesn't matter which passages we choose. We find ourselves in the scripture. We find ourselves in the parables. It's a fascinating story. Sometime I encourage you to sit down and pick what are your three favorite Bible passages and open up the Bible and find three passages you've never read before and try to tell your story and the story of your family and what's going on for you and the story of your church in those passages. Our lives are filled with parables. Our lives are filled with wisdom. We so often read them as if a story and just read to the end instead of paying attention to who are the people in our lives. When do they come out and come back into our lives again? When do they go to be with God? And what does that mean? And when do we gather at table? And when do we walk through the garden? And when do we sing together? <laughs>